So welcome to Liberation Hour Radio, another show. I'm your host, Rob McNeil. We're on Facebook and YouTube, on Roger's channel, 946 Cable, and also streaming live at RadioWaterloo.ca, 102.7 FM in Kitchener, Waterloo. And I'm very excited to have Jake Conroy with us, the uh, famous Jake Conroy of Shack 7 and many other endeavors. Welcome, Jake. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I wouldn't go as far as to say famous, but I will take Jake Conroy. Okay, well, we could go with infamous if you like. That works too. So, Jake, wow, it's such an honor to have you on the show. I've been a, a huge fan for a very long time, as, is, as are many of my fellow activists. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to, uh, to be here. Awesome, awesome. Uh, many people know you as the Cranky Vegan with your Three Minute Thursdays. Can you talk a little bit about that show and the inspiration for it? Yeah. Um, it's The Cranky Vegan is a YouTube channel that I do. Um, I have three series on there, basically one called um, Three Minute Thursdays, which is three minutes of your favorite uh, animal rights news and gossip all packed into a short, sweet three minutes, which is never three minutes and oftentimes not on a Thursday. Um, but it's basically just kind of like a fake news show. Well, it's not fake, but you know, it's uh, me just talking about what kind of has happened in the last week or two in the grassroots animal rights movement and me just pontificating and editorializing about it. Um, I have another one called uh, My Friends Do the Coolest Shit which is me interviewing uh, friends or, or people that I really admire their work um, and trying to get them to tell interesting stories about their activism um, because I, I find a lot of inspiration in what people have done in the past. Um, and I think by learning from our history, we can in turn um, become stronger and better and more strategic activists in the future. And then the final piece, our final series on the channel is called Are We Winning? which is, um, it's kind of morphed over the last couple of years, but basically just me talking about strategies, specific strategies and tactics um, on how we can build our campaigns to be a little bit bigger and better. Um, and I think like that kind of, the kind of the inspiration for it was, I think, you know, when I started the channel a couple of years ago, I was seeing a lot of like rhetoric from the animal rights movement, both on a national level and a grassroots level of like, you know, we are at this tipping point and we are winning and we are, we are, um, you, you know, we are the fastest gro growing social justice movement in, in the world. And I just was like, are you, are you out of your mind? Like, where is that information coming from? Like, we are by far not the fastest growing social justice movement in the world, um, which we can just see as evidence from the last couple weeks in the United States um, and the Black Lives Matter movement spreading around the world. Um, and, and we are certainly not at a tipping point for non-human animals. Um, and we certainly are not winning. So um, that was kind of the inspiration just of me just saying like, really, are, are we winning? Because I, I, I would push back on that. And so um, I just kind of, kind of took my snarky, obnoxious attitude and put it onto a uh, YouTube channel, which some people enjoy and a lot of people hate. So it works out. Well, they say uh, any strong emotion is uh, evokes action. So I know I'm sure your rants are designed to get people to think critically about what they're doing and, and uh, you know, change course if necessary. So I certainly uh, appreciate most of the content uh, on there and um, I'm a keen fan. So if you're willing, we could get into the plant meat of the matter, uh, pressure campaigns. Um, recently, we, sh we saw your Shack 7 campaign featured on Netflix's uh, Animal People documentary. Can you briefly describe that campaign and what its goals were? It's a huge, it's a huge question, a huge story, but I think it's a very important one. Um, I would recommend people watch the movie, The Animal People on Netflix, because it gives you a little bit of an overview of what was going on. But essentially it was a grassroots um, effort in the animal rights movement to shut down one of the world's largest testing laboratories 
called Huntington Life Sciences or HLS. Um, and so it, the, the campaign started in England uh, in, in the year 2000. It spread to the United States in 2001 and continued to spread to over 18 countries around the world. Um, and it was done in a way that um, had kind of been honed and developed by activists in the United Kingdom since the mid 90s. Um, the idea of putting pressure um, on a corporation, but more, more importantly, putting pressure on their, on, on their secondary and tertiary support systems. And what I mean by that is not just protesting against the laboratory, but protesting against every company the laboratory needs in order to stay open. So every company needs other companies to stay open, right? They need insurance, they need a bank account, they need people to finance them. If they're a publicly traded company, they need shareholders, they need a board of directors, they need to be able to trade their shares on the stock market, they need an internet company, they need food suppliers and so forth and so on. Um, and so there was kind of like, you know, the people started it in the 90s, looked at the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, where, you know, people were really angry about apartheid in South Africa, but outside of the country, there wasn't much people could do. And so um, organizers realized, well, there's a lot of banks that are located around the world that prop up the country financially. And so if we can all go after those banks and encourage them to strip their, their financial support of the country, we could make a big impact and it, and it worked. Um, so, you know, the, the company, or excuse me, the activists in England really started putting pressure on all the banks. Um, and that essentially drove the company into bankruptcy. Um, and, and that's kind of where the story takes off and why it came to the United States. They moved their finances from England to the United States in hopes that they could be protected there because they didn't think there was a big animal rights movement. The other beautiful thing about the, the organization and the movement was that it, it's very horizontally organized um, with the idea that there wasn't like a very strict leadership of people at the top saying like, you do this, you do this, and you do this, and this is the only thing you're allowed to do. It was more of like an organization, Shack USA, which was myself and a handful of friends, um, coming up with our own roadmap and blueprint to shut this place down and encouraging people to follow it. But if they felt that they wanted to do something different or there was another roadmap that they thought was better, we would support them in that effort um, in, in kind of making this movement their own and taking ownership over that, which I think is also really important in organizing. Um, and, and there was also a very like diverse use of tactics, of a diversity of tactics being used. So you had, you know, in terms of what we would support as an organization, we supported anything and everything um, that was strategic and, and wasn't, and didn't inflict um, physical violence against any animal, human or non-human. So, you know, people were engaging in letter writing and petitions and, and emails and faxes, if anyone remembers fax machines, uh, fax blockades, uh, protests, civil disobedience, protests outside of office building, homes. Um, and then there was illegal elements to it as well, as again, civil disobedience. Um, and there was an underground movement that also participated um, that were like doing petty vandalism, uh, liberating animals, that type of thing. And, and, and no one was organizing all of this or financing all of it, but we all kind of supported one another in our, in our ideologies um, in order to use strong resistance to shut down a really large corporation. Um, and ultimately, I think it was a highly successful campaign. Unfortunately, we didn't shut the laboratory down, but we didn't shut the laboratory. We, we didn't shut them down, not because we failed and what we did wasn't working. Rather, it was working too well. And we became, at least in the United States and in England, we, came, we became really heavily targeted by the U.S., by the governments, um, which eventually charged us um, on a variety of different charges. And um, we're, you know, we took it to trial and we lost and we were all sentenced to um, prison time. It's uh, quite, quite the story. And thanks, thanks for that summary. Um, it just, it's so inspiring. And I think, you know, whether you feel that it's unfortunate that you didn't shut the lab down, like you, I think you inspired uh, pressure campaigns um, all over the world. And I think uh, animal people is uh, destined to maybe do the same thing again, to introduce those ideas to new generation. You know, things like uh, you had an advert, I think for a brick, Uh, smashing idea against vivisection. It's just a paper advert. You know, nobody's actually telling anybody to do anything. The shack, <laughs> the shack match with the address of the lab inside the matchbook. Uh, yeah. Possibly, you know, some of these choices might be second guessed in a lot of what happened. 
and the, uh, the recognized gang members guy with uh, pictures of different types of policemen and how to, uh, how to recognize them. I think like the beauty of the campaign was that it was people could people could respond to this laboratory in any way that they saw fit. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we agreed with them all the time. In fact, there were times that we didn't. Um, and we were, you know, there were tactics used that we certainly were not okay with. But I think, I think the beauty of like a horizontally organized, decentralized movement is that people get to participate in the way that they want. Um, and they can be as creative as they want. And they can learn from the things that work. And they can learn from the things that fail. I think a lot of times we're afraid to take chances because they might not work. Um, but I think, I think there's two things that come out of it. One, it might work. And if it works, then we're highly successful. If we fail, then we've learned a really important lesson and we can pick apart why it failed and make sure we don't do it in the future. Um, I think the grassroots animal rights movement is, is in a place now where we continually do the same thing over and over and over and over again and think we're doing something new when in fact, what we're doing now is, you know, we've been doing for 20, 30 years. Um, with not, in my opinion, not to a, lo a lot of success. And so I think like that creativity, that space for creativity in our organizing and interactivism is incredibly important. And yeah, sometimes you're going to be wise asses and snarky and cheeky and make, you know, matchbooks and put adverts in for bricks. Um, and, and, you know, or, or sometimes that means someone's going to figure out how to charge $100,000 to someone's credit card. Or that means someone's going to figure out how to break into a laboratory and rescue 14, you know, beagle dogs or figure out where someone lives and have a demonstration at their home. Um, it, these cre these, this creativity that is fostered and, and, and supported through that type of grassroots organizing and activism, I think, is critically important to, to winning. Yeah, thanks for that. And, uh, it kind of came through in the, in the documentary just at times how much fun you all were having. Know, there was a camaraderie there. You stayed in some house where there was never any food, but everybody just uh, worked all the time. And I think that, you know, I'm going to be doing this for three years in my activism, and it's certainly been an evolution. But I think that's one of the things that I, that I hold dear that uh, some people just want to do stuff, but a lot of people need to, to make it fun. Uh, and it can be both. It can be both fun and effective. It's not all, uh, you know. It's not all fun and daisies, but uh, and it's a serious business in a lot of ways. But you can you can have fun along the way, and if I could just, I think that's the way we get more people active is by showing them things that are both fun and effective. And like you say, not just doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, we've certainly been inspired by some of your actions, including home demos for Stop Maple Leaf Violence. And, uh, we did one at the Toronto Liberation Conference last year, where, where somebody found the massive billionaire's uh, home that owns Safina Foods that runs the biggest pig slaughterhouse and had a big front lawn in front of his gates and we set up you know pictures of the murdered piggies and had death there and uh, in, in an outfit and it's, it's all just uh, it's just good fun you know as well as being horribly uh, you know horribly effective hopefully or at least horribly unappealing to the uh, to the animal users or animal users for sure um, yeah so do you think that the um, the leaderless kind of grassroots horizontal organization, do you think that was one of the, the downfalls that led you to being targeted? They, they seem to associate you with the underground element and just managed to convince the courts that in some way it was because of you? Yeah, I mean, we weren't, we weren't charged with doing any of the illegal activity. We were charged with essentially running a web page that supported those ideologies. Um, it became a real issue of free speech, really, at the end of the day. You know, in the United States, we have our First Amendment right of freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, um, freedom of association, freedom of press. Um, so it was our belief, and most people that examine the case, that it was our First Amendment right to support the idea of illegal direct action. Um, I, I think, like, the idea of, like, a leaderless movement is something that um, pe people and, and organizations like a government can't quite understand. Like they are used to that hierarchical structure um, and that chain of command. So they can't fathom the idea that people would just go out and do something and, you know, take responsibility on themselves to, to try to change something in the world. Um, and I think that's something they just couldn't really understand. 
but I, I you know, and it talks a little bit about in the movie, but I, you know, I think, I think the, you know, the animal liberation front and the underground direct action movement in, in the, in the animal rights movement, um, you know, it's been around almost since the beginning of the modern day animal rights movement um, in the early eighties in the United States and in the early seventies in, in England. Um, and it is something that they've always wanted to break and dismantle and they never could. I think they're famously, the FBI is famously quoted as that it was, they found it harder to infiltrate the animal liberation movement than it was to infiltrate the mob. Um, and so I think um, because they could never dismantle that organization, partly because it is a non-hierarchical autonomous organization with no leadership, um, they turned their sights to those that were supporting those ideas and propping up those ideas. And at the time that was the Shaq campaign. Um, and so they were trying to, you know, again, as, as I believe Ryan Shapiro says in the movie, or maybe it was Will Potter, but talking about how like cutting off the head of that grassroots animal rights movement in hopes that the animal, you know, the body dies uh, was kind of a strategy, take both of them out. And to a certain extent, it, it worked, unfortunately. Unfortunately, yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely a burning question for me. I think what you said resonates that uh, you were perhaps too successful were so successful that uh, that they focused and, and ultimately we're fighting some really huge powers power structures and uh it looked it looked like from the movie at least that the government just kind of said well we can we can take these people down i don't know how balanced the the movie was in terms of the, the court case and what was done but from what was in the movie it just seemed you know a slam dunk that you were just expressing freedom of speech and there was no evidence of of, of anything that should have got you hard time but they just they didn't care weird yeah the court case was a bit of a, a sham i mean it was a total railroading i mean I, you know in the movie they talk about how we were not allowed to talk about what huntington life sciences did or what happened inside of huntington life sciences from our perspective but they were able to talk about all the research and life-saving research they were doing inside the laboratory that was one example of probably dozens of, of times that we were silenced or not allowed to create a defense or, you know, just railroaded into the ground by the judge in the court system. Um, so, yeah, I and mean, obviously the movie can't tell the whole story, you know, but um, yeah, it, it's, it, the, the court case was pretty appalling. Yeah, I'm sorry for your, sorry for your luck or, or lack thereof. Um, yeah, you win some, you lose some, right? I mean, <laughs> you can't win all of them. This was, this was serious. I mean, I, I believe you were sentenced to four years under the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act and maybe served three, which is just, I mean, it's astounding to me. It was before my time. I don't know how supported you were in there. I, I, I imagine you were in a diff different facility to the other members. Did you have anybody of your team in with you? No, obviously the United States is like a super big country and it's built on the prison industrial complex. So they have many, many, many places to put you. Um, so we were all kind of spread out all around the country. Oddly enough, like the government does take requests. So you can be like, oh, I'd like to go to prison in this area. So interestingly, we all kind of got sent to, to areas we wanted to go. Um, I didn't end up where I wanted to go in terms of a prison, but I definitely ended up, you know, I, I was living in California at the time and I went to prison in California. So I'm sure in their eyes that was, that was like, a success for them but um yeah i got put into uh, a prison I, w I served um 37 months in two federal prisons and then six months in a transition house and then three years on federal probation um and then we did two years of like pre-trial probation like before you go to before you go to trial you're put onto this like probationary period as well where you're monitored by the government so it really was for me almost 10 years of from the very beginning to the very end of like dealing with this legal situation. Um, but yeah, so I, I spent 25 months in a prison in Adelanto, California, which is in the Mojave Desert, um, about an hour and a half northeast of, of Los Angeles, California. It was a medium security prison and it was, you know, it's the real deal. Like that was a legit like prison that you would see, you know, in the movies and books and magazines. So, you know, there were, gang politics and race politics and there were uh, race riots and beatings and stabbings and fights like every single day uh, and and you know as someone that's that's not my life like i'm not terribly interested in gang or race politics um you know you're thrown into this situation um as as all of us were 
um, and you're kind of left to figure this this new life out and and navigate it without you know getting really hurt. You know, at least in the prison I was in, there you know there are like you get your handbook from the prison that's like you have to do this and these are all the rules. But then there's like a whole another inmate culture, which is a whole another way you have to carry yourself. Um, and and the punishment for that isn't like solitary confinement it's like you get the living crap beat out of you you break these rules and people will beat you up um so you know there was like this this line that needed to be walked of like i'm not going to compromise my ethics and my my opinions and my my feelings um and my morals but also like i have to make sure i don't get the living hell kicked out of me um at the same time so you have to figure all that stuff out really quickly um and, and navigate accordingly Wow, it's, uh, it's, I, I can't imagine. I hope I don't have to you know, experience that. I hope most activists don't. Um, kudos to you. As I said, it was before my time, but what was the reaction of the animal rights community, of the people that weren't uh, sentenced to prison, to your conviction? Did you feel, did you get support while you're inside, some letter writing or access to outside information? Yeah, so. Um... Throughout the campaign and throughout the trial, the, the larger national rights and welfare organizations in the United States did not like us and did not want anything to do with us. In fact, if I remember correctly, at least one of them came out with a statement saying that we belonged in jail. Um, from the grassroots movement, uh, we had a lot of support. And I think, you know, when you go to prison, they kind of give you three ways to keep in touch and, and, and maintain your sense of self. Um, so they allow you to uh, make phone calls if you can afford it. They allow you visits if they permit it, and they allow you to um, send and receive mail. And so for me, they made that really difficult to obtain any of those three things. Um, but, you know, I got lots of support from people around the world. It was to the point where it was over overwhelming in like a really beautiful way. You know, in the first couple months, I was probably getting 20 to 50 letters a day from people just writing support. Um, and, you know, I, if, if my mail was processed and given to me every day, which it was not by the, by this, by the prison, um, I would have received mail every single day of, of my incarceration. Um, and being able to write letters to people and have people write back is like this really great way to, you know, build these bonds of friendship with people that, you know, you normally would not have an opportunity to do so really. Um, you know, I made friends with people around the world that I'm still friends with today that I still hang out with and, and um, spend time with and interact with all because we just started writing letters to each other while we were in prison or while I was in prison, um, you know, 10 years ago. So, um, yeah, I think supporting political prisoners is incredibly important. Write them letters, send them a book, put money, um, donate money to their, their support funds, uh, whatever you can do to support them, I think is really important. Yeah, thanks for saying that, for, for painting a picture. I'm glad you got some support, at least, and seem to have come out the other side. Okay, I, I know there's a lot of turmoil, you know, right now. Uh, Black Lives Matter protests are, are awesome, but I hope a lot of people are waking up to the prison industrial complex. Uh, 13th, when I saw it uh, a while back, it kind of blew my mind. And I guess it was always in the back of my mind that if activists got arrested that they would at least be supported you know from the outside and possibly it might even be a, an inspiration uh, to others in some way but I'm still sorry you had to go through that I, I have one question and that's like could you write to your other conspirators in their prisons or I think the rule was yeah you're not allowed to write or it'd be in communication with people in other prisons um, and when you get out of prison and you're on probation you're not allowed to contact anyone that has a felony conviction um, so you have to be really careful about who you're communicating with, who you're spending time with. Um, I think in our case, they were mostly concerned that they didn't want us talking to each other, the co-defendants talking to each other. So, you know, I went years and years without talking to my co-defendants, you know, like Kevin, for instance, I think it was almost 10 years before we were allowed to talk to one another, it, you know, with his prison sentence and his probationary period and mine as well. It's just, it was a long time. It's amazing. Um, I mean, if you... Are you in touch now, though, with some of your co-conspirators or at least co-convictees? Co-defendants, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm in touch with them for sure. Okay, well, I think we'll just take a short break there, and uh, after the break, we'll be back with more of the infamous uh, Jake Conroy. Thanks uh, for being here.
where six activists who are indicted under federal terrorism laws. U.S. attorneys called it a campaign of terrorism. We didn't break anything. We didn't burn anything. We didn't beat anyone. We didn't even so much as trespass. Our crime is doing exactly what I'm doing right now, speaking. Any threat to cause a loss of profit to a corporation is now considered an act of terrorism. We are committed to working with our partners to disrupt and dismantle these movements, to protect our fellow citizens, and to bring to justice those who disrupt business and inflict serious economic damage. The largest accounting firm in the world just backed up within 24 hours. This wasn't about solving a crime. This was about sending a message that you better shut up. The share price dropped from like $30 to a few pennies. That's not terrorism. That's effective activism. Every ounce of progress that we've had towards a more just world has come because there were people who were willing to fight and willing to sacrifice. The police had set up this free speech zone, which makes you wonder, then what's everything outside of the free speech zone? There were more wiretaps used against people associated with this movement than any other counterterrorism investigation in US history. There was no direct evidence of any unlawful conduct. What will happen when the activists move to the timber industry or the defense industry? If this continues, the extremists will have won, and the loser will be humanity. Okay, welcome back to Liberation Hour Radio. We're on with Jake Conroy. We are on Facebook and YouTube, FM 102.7 in Kitchener, Waterloo. And on Rogers Channel 946. Tell us a little bit about um, some of the things in your bio. I believe you're involved with the Rainforest Action Network. I am, yeah. I, I've worked with the Rainforest Action Network as my day job the last, I don't know, eight years or something. Um, we are an environmental organization that um, uses pressure campaigns in, in um, a various uh, buckets of work. So we do a lot of work around deforestation uh, in rainforests, particularly in Indonesia, um, in the last eight or nine years, um, fighting the palm oil industry. Um, uh, we also have a, a climate bucket. So we, we go after, presently going after banks to get them to um, no longer uh, fund um, fossil fuel extraction projects. And then we also do like a small grants program um, where we give uh, about two hundred and fifty to four hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year of small grants to indigenous communities, frontline communities um, that are fighting back against these projects um, in their in their um, communities, um, because we feel that they are in the best position to lead these fights um, and and to win them. So we believe in funding indigenous communities and frontline communities um, and giving them the resources in the ways that they ask for them and that they need them. Uh, in order to win. And so those are kind of the three, the three areas that we do. We target a lot of different companies. On the climate side of things, we, we do target the banks that, um, it, it, that fund fossil fuel extraction. So currently we have a campaign against Chase, JP Morgan Chase, um, for their work, or excuse me, for their funding of um, pipeline projects um, and, and broader like you know, climate justice issues. Um, and then in Indonesia, the last several years, we've been working on campaigns. And this is kind of talks a little, goes back to the Shack campaign a little bit about secondary and tertiary targeting. You know, there's companies in, in Indonesia that are responsible for the, the destruction of the rainforest there and decimating, um, you know, in critical habitat for endangered animals, um, indigenous lands that have been indigenous lands for centuries. Um, and, and again, just destroying the environment. Um, but they're companies that you and I probably never heard of. And so by going after secondary and tertiary targets, we're, allowed, we're, we're able to bring this issue to the public. Um, so, you know, we, have pro, we had campaigns against like PepsiCo um, because they source their palm, a lot of their palm oil and their products from Indonesia. So going after these kind of secondary targets and allowing people to kind of realize, oh, these are the main players. These are the ones that are driving this deforestation. Um, allows, you know, allows for a campaign that everyone will want to get on board with. Like if, you know, if someone was like, oh, we need to protest against PTABN, everyone would be like, who the hell is that? 
Um, but if I tell you, oh, we have a campaign against PepsiCo, you know, Pepsi, everyone's like, oh, I know who Pepsi is. And so it, it makes a, that campaign a little more digestible um, to, to the public. Um, but it works. Um, and we've seen a lot of companies, um, including some of the world's largest, like Cargill, uh, pledge to not use um, any source, any, any uh, palm oil from deforested areas of, of, you know, from rainforest and whatnot. Um, it's another thing to hold their feet to the fire after they pledge to do so, but it is like that first step uh, of, of moving towards, um, I think, a bigger and broader success in those issues. But that's a measure of success. Thanks for sharing that. I was gonna ask about any specific success stories that you could pull out of that experience. But, uh, and we did talk about no swearing before 9 p.m. So I'm going to have to edit out Cargill, the name. Maybe we can just. <laughs> I was like, oh, did I, did I mess up? Uh, they, yeah. they have a, in our tiny little town, they have a, a chicken slaughterhouse that uh, makes all the McNuggets for Canada. So it's 100,000 chickens a day. And uh, we've been doing a lot of activism against them for, for a number of years. The cargo can campaign was really interesting because that was one that was kind of reaching ahead when I first started. Um, but, you know, we did demonstrations at facilities and, and, and petitions and things like that. But what really started to kind of hold their feet to the fire was doing these protests at their homes. I mean, they're, I believe they're the largest corporation in the world that's still privately owned by, by the family. And they all kind of live in YZ, Minnesota, I believe. And so, you know, we started doing home demonstrations, doing protests in YZ, and like, we made these like fake orangutans that were like life-size and had them hold signs that said like, we'll work for Habitat and like strategically place them around this small town where we knew they would see them at night. So when they showed up in the morning, there was all these like orangutans that had like taken over the city or taken over the town. Uh, just kind of, again, like those creative, interesting ideas that gets people's attention and you bring it right to their doorstep and it's hard for them to ignore it. tell that I hate Cargill's. The worst company in the world, uh, I think, was the name of one of the articles about the largest family of billionaires, and it's, it's you know, generational yeah. now. It's unfortunate that they are based in such a small town, although it provides some advantages as, as, as well, I guess. But uh, I, love, I love the idea of home demos. I know they're controversial, but they, they sure do get people's attention and the media's attention. And I just, I love activism of any kind, so. Thanks for, thanks for getting back into it when you got out. That's, uh, that's yeah. awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, just digging into the theory a little bit, I, I saw one of your rants, you had a, a picture, I hope we can, we can throw it up here in the video, of um, some pillars, the pillars mm -hmm. of the campaign and, and working on it. And uh, it's something that's been an evolution for me over time. I, I started like an awful lot of activists working on kind of the demand side outreach um, vigils and I, I still respect you know that stuff I still believe animals deserve to be born witness to and, and getting that stuff out is important but it's been a, a revelation and an inspiration to me to to start to look at pressure campaigns and really understanding you know the points of decision and stuff I don't know if you're willing to, to briefly talk about about that we can't just do outreach the same way we can't just do protest or we can't just use direct action but you have to do all of it um, and then when we realize that, I think we can, we, we can start fleshing out these, these campaigns and the things that we want to change, regardless of how small or how big you want to go for. Everyone has multiple pillars of support that prop them up, whether that's an individual or a corporation or a government. Like, uh, and when we can realize what those pillars are um, and use all the variety of different tactics to start chipping away at all those pillars, then you're going to start to see the roof cave in. 
And I think when the roof caves in, that's when we start to win. Um, I have a second video, which you also briefly referenced about uh, points of, of intervention, um, which is in the organizing circle, it's, you know, the five points of intervention, where there are five different areas where if we apply the pressure properly, um, we really have to start picking away at all five. And those points, and let me see if I can remember them. Uh, the point of uh, decision, the point of consumption, the point of production, the point of assumption, and the point of, shoot. Do destruction? I think you did that one already. Point of destruction, yeah. So in the animal rights movement, that focuses almost entirely on education outreach as a strategy, we pick away at two of those. Point of assumption, which is kind of like that area where you are kind of, you know, you're, you're kind of indoctrinated with ideas. So that's like advertisement and culture and things like that. And, and educational outreach is great at picking away at that. And the second piece I would argue would be like point of consumption, like which are like in, in the animal rights movement would be like grocery stores and uh, fur salons and things like that. And those are the two we pick at with educational outreach. But when we ignore all these other points of, of decision where, you know, board members and, and CEOs and corporations are deciding about these issues, when we pass up point of destruction where, where like, you know, that can be slaughterhouses and that can be um, uh, f uh, fur farms. But when you look at other movements and you look at other social justice movements, um, and, and, and again, there, there aren't and, uh, like social justice movements that are doing it perfectly and winning every single time. They're making mistakes and learning from them but they're moving along at a much faster pace than we are in the animal rights movement. And that's because they all use pressure campaigning to succeed. Um, it might not look like pressure campaigning that we would want to do in the animal rights movement all the time, but it is, you know, that, that is how they're doing it from the environmental movement to the social justice, to um, uh, civil rights movement of the fifties and sixties use pressure campaigning. Um, even the black lives matter and the, and the movement for black lives currently going on is pressure campaigning. They're going after the police departments. They're going after the politicians. They're trying to defund the police and they're winning. Like it works. And, and for some reason in the animal rights movement, and there, I have all my thoughts about that too, but like we don't trust in that system. We don't trust in that idea, despite the fact that it continues to work over and over and over again. Thanks for, for that level of detail. I think uh, one of my takeaways is the strategizing needs to be sounder when we take a step back and, and strategize about what to do and look at the history of social movements and study theories of social change and are open to other viewpoints then you know a lot more can be can be achieved um i know uh, gene sharp i think talked about the 198 methods of nonviolent action mm -hmm. of which uh, a boycott like veganism is a boycott is only one or two and uh i you know there's just so there's so much to learn you normally end up uh, getting thrown into something, you join a group, you're suddenly you're doing stuff and uh, you know, time passes and I think that time could be spent more effectively. But to be fair, if we think we have something more effective, we have to, we have to design it and sell people on it and, uh, and, and, and drag people in positively. And uh, it's, it's uh, all good fun. Would you uh, have any advice to someone that was wanting to learn more about pressure campaigns, where they could actually go, a particular resource or a particular book or film yeah i think um i think i would for like an online resource i'd probably go to uh, the ruckus society which is an organization that has been around for a while um, and they do and have done trainings uh, direct action trainings on how to do like you know blockading and banner hangs and things like that but they're online resources around how to create um, campaigns and pressure campaigns and social change I think is really great and that's probably um, where I would I would point people to on an, in an online capacity thank you for that yeah I love some of the ruckus society's uh, resources simple you know there seems some stuff you can print out and really absorb but they've, they've done a lot of cool stuff uh, over the years for sure yeah uh, dr stephen best professor of philosophy in texas in the animal people documentary said 
that violence and sabotage and threats of violence is what moves history. How do you how do you feel about that that quote or that feeling? Um, I I probably would not necessarily equate sabotage with violence. I think sabotage can be violent, but I think sabotage doesn't always have to be violent. I think uh, economic sabotage has been used in the animal rights movement since the early 70s, um, and, and I would consider that to be physically violent. Um, I, I don't believe that um, you know damaging property or you know property in general is is violent. Um, but I do think that he is correct that that violence has pushed forward social change since the very beginning. I think it's an unfortunate reality of the world that we live in that violence has been used um, and, and violence is a language that people respond to, um, <clears throat> which I think is unfortunate. I don't think anyone likes violence or wants to use violence. Um, but I mean, we can look at every social justice movement that has achieved anything and seen that violence has been used. That being said, I think the animal rights movement is in a unique position um, to not have to use violence. I think we have a lot of creativity and we have a lot of um, strategy and, and tactics and smarts and passion um, that we can use in order to enact change uh, without using physical violence. Um, again, I think we, we can get into a bigger discussion about what is violence and is physical or excuse me, is property destruction violent or not? Um, and I, as I said, I would argue it's not, but I, but I think that using all the tactics that we have used in the past, like we do have this opportunity to be successful uh, without using physical violence. Yeah, thank you. I tend to, I tend to agree. I think uh, it is a different social justice movement that we have, but we all struggle with the idea that these animals are literally being exploited you know there's 10 million chickens within 100 kilometers of, of london ontario and and they're going in every day and literally being murdered so by definition i think that makes us speciesists when we you know watch the truck and get really sad because we if it was a truck full of human babies we'd probably do a little more so um i think like racism i mean i think i think and, and bigotry i think speciesism is something that we all have like i i think this notion that if if you're a speciesist then you're not vegan it's just kind of like I'm not saying that's what you're saying but i hear that so much as like you know as a put down like oh you're a speciesist if you think this or you're a speciesist if you if you think that it's like we're all speciesists i understand the idea of speciesism and i agree with it as a, as a concept but i just think this like notion that we use it as an insult in the animal rights movement to put other activists down is just kind of silly to me i don't know I definitely agree that, uh, you know, putting other activists down is non-productive. There's so much infighting. So I'm glad, you know, you kind of touched on that. It's also equally hard to not say something when you see something that, that is wrong. I think it's something we'll struggle with forever. But personally, I believe in exploring ideas like nonviolent communication or at least understanding what's behind it. Uh, that, you know, only empathy can help you understand that, that everybody, everybody essentially is a good person, or at least thinks they are. They may do mm -hmm. bad things, they may be doing a wrong thing, but they're doing it for a reason. And understanding more about what those reasons are um, is, is, is critical. I'd almost expand that from my standpoint and say, it's not just accusing someone of being a speciesist, it's accusing them of either a lack of purity or a lack of you know, tactics that, that you approve of, it's that you know, you need to do things my way. And it's kind of, to me, it goes back to what I was saying about if we think we have a better way. We have to show it. We have to, to lead by example. And I totally agree that, that uh, you know, the, the enemy is animal agriculture. The enemy is capitalism. It's not other people that are doing what they can. If you hate non-vegans per se, then you have to hate yourself usually at one point in the past. And a lot of the people around you that haven't haven't changed yet so I, I do think it's all grounded in uh, in ways of communicating and empathizing with people and, uh, and like you say having bigger discussions about about what's important I mean put downs are always just a just a bad idea just a lazy way of, of, of trying to dominate another human and it's funny because the concept of speciesism of, of not seeing people as others or, or lesser is is you know is a human supremacy thing but it's also grounded in this idea that that uh i'm better than you and uh and it's expanding the circle of compassion to to know that i'm just different than you i mean if i 
wanted to be you, I'd get rid of this cheap suit jacket and I'd have that hat. That's just not... <laughs> It's not going to look good on me. I, I love my own hair. So we have to we have to find ways to get along, you know. I see so much infighting in the movement of, uh, you know, uh, you you might be fighting for uh, marine land, but you're not you're not not even vegan. What do we do there? You know, we're we're not even on most people's radar screen. We have to find ways to ally. And I've seen so many examples uh, of activists uh, talking about past campaigns, social justice campaigns, how they allied with other people that were not like them to make progress. And it's, it's, it's so important. Empathy to me at the end of the day is the answer and finding ways to communicate. You know, um, I agree if people have problematic behavior, then you have to deal with it. Um, I hope we can evolve to, to some kind of structure where we find ways that we can just talk about, talk about stuff, talk about what is driving people to make decisions and the world is so far from that that it's it's hard to imagine but that's you know i'm not usually all that positive a person but that's that's the hope that i have you know um that we can talk about you know meeting meeting needs and, and what is making people do things because people do things for a reason you know we we're all born innocent babies and and whatever happened uh, to to make us do what we do now there's there's a reason there's a reason for it it's the grassroots of what we're dealing with with Bill 156, this ag gag law. The idea that farmers feel threatened, especially by recent, uh, you know, kind of meet the victims or in invasions and rescue of animals that they they profess to be scared for their families and their homes and their private property, and uh, and you have to understand that. We have to understand that part of it is a story to cover up that they just don't want people, you know, looking inside their barns, but part of it is fear and until we can sit down and actually work work out how to move forward it's it's going to be an interesting time and you know friction provides opportunity friction provides attention what does the future hold for the cranky vegan and and jake and how can people find you and support your important work yeah um i have no idea what comes next a lot of crankiness i'm sure um yeah, I mean, the life is a little different now with the, the the COVID pandemic. And, you know, at the time I was doing a lot of speaking, a lot of traveling around and, and things like that. I'm hoping at some point I'll be able to get back to that. Um, I've been doing um, these eight hour workshops with my friend Linda, who comes from um, an environmental and human rights background. And she and I have been doing um, these eight hour trainings on how to do pressure campaigns, um, which I thought were really valuable. Um, and we basically had to leave Europe um, in order to come back before the borders were shut down um, due to the pandemic, but we were kind of like mid tour. Um, so hopefully we can get back to that. Uh, I'm sure there'll be more irritating rants and ravings on my YouTube channel and which is the Cranky Vegan. Also on Instagram and Facebook as the Cranky Vegan. And uh, yeah, I'm just continue pushing forward on campaigns that inspire me and, and doing activism that excites me and feels like um, we have chances of winning at and um, see where we end up. And, and what can we do to, to support you better or in some of your uh, campaign actions? What I want people to do ultimately is to think about what we're doing. Um, I want them to think about and study the history of, of the grassroots animal rights movement um, and use those skills and those ideas to start forming smart campaigns. And by smart, I, I, I mean like campaigns that are going to um, move things forward, but are also realistic um, to, to fit inside of our wheelhouses as, as communities and as organizations. Um, and I want to um, see us start utilizing all the strategic tools in the toolbox to make change. Um, I, I feel like the animal rights movement is a bit... Um, circular in its history. And I feel like um, having been involved in the animal rights movement for 25 years, that I think we're starting to get back to this point where campaigning um, is, and, and particularly pressure campaigning um, is going to become more prevalent and, and more on people's radars. Um, and I'm hoping that um, in some small way, I can help move that along. Thanks for saying that. Um, is there any go-to book or resource that you would recommend for people to study the the social justice history and how it might relate to animal rights? Yeah, I, there's a web page called The Talon Conspiracy, which is a, a tough name, but it's called The Talon, T-A-L-O-N Conspiracy. Um, and they, it's actually Josh, who's my co-defendant, 
runs a web page that has uh, magazines and newsletters and pamphlets and zines um, from the animal rights movement from around the world that goes back to the 60s. modern day animal rights movement isn't that old. Like you want to talk to someone that did campaigning in the seventies in England, like they're all around and they, they're all down to like share ideas and talk with you and, you know, but you have to be willing to go out and find those people and, and, and build bonds and friendships with them. Like what we should be doing um, and learning from them and asking questions. And, and, and so I would encourage people to do that. Um, and then, you know, there are books about organizing that are animal rights related, but like what we said, you know, the ruckus society webpage, um, like the book, This is an Uprising, I think is a good place to start. Um, and, and just kind of digging into those pieces. I, I think there's this notion that we need to be doing something every day of every hour of every second. We need to be active regardless of what it is. And if you're not, then you're not doing enough. But I do think there's so much value in, in putting the brakes on and, and, and looking and studying and researching what we can be doing. Um, if we are really in this for the long haul, then not only are we doing ourselves a disservice and wasting our time, we're really doing a disservice and wasting the time and the lives of the billions and billions of non-human animals that are being killed every single year. You said in Animal People, if we really want to stop picking away leaves and branches and dig up the roots of the issues, we're going to find capitalism down there and uh, the quest for absolute power, not, not individuals, something to that effect. Can we talk briefly about that? So yeah, I think something I always say uh, is that uh, the meat eater isn't the problem. Uh, the meat eater is the symptom of the bigger problem. And so again, the animal rights movement, particularly the grassroots animal rights movement, relies heavily on educational outreach as a way to move forward, to, to, to win. Um, but that requires us to focus solely on the meat eater, the, the person that's consuming animals. And, and, and I know it's controversial, people don't like to hear, but they aren't the problem. They are the symptom of a bigger problem. Um, so, you know, when you catch a cold, you don't, you don't try to stop the, the, the sneeze or the cough, you try to stop the infection. And I think that's what we need to be doing in our activism is we need to be going after the, the, the root causes of, of why people eat animals. And, and while capitalism isn't the only reason that people eat animals, it's one of them. Um, and I think we need to think about, you know, the corporations that are pushing these, these dead animals on the, the public and convincing them that this is the things that we need to be eating in order to be healthy. Um, the, the culture and the systems that prop up eating and eating animals and drinking their secretions. We need to be picking away at those things. You know, I often, like I said in the movie, like I often think of it as like a tree. Like we are just, when we're trying to talk to individuals, we're just picking leaves off of this massive tree. And by the time we get to the bottom, the top has already grown back. Like we're just constantly picking leaves. But if we really want to like dismantle this, the system, we need to just chop away at the trunk and at the limbs and start digging up the roots of the problem so that the tree can't regrow. Um, and I think to me, like that is how we should look at social change. Um, and, I, and I think focusing on the individual, focusing on that individual leaf and picking it off the tree just ends us up with a tree that's constantly regrowing. Thanks for saying that. I guess I'm going to include this, but I don't know if I actually put it in the tape that uh, perhaps an analogy with your involvement with the Rainforest Action Network that doesn't involve killing a tree would be, would be useful. But... <laughs> I know what you're saying. I just don't want to upset the, the tree people. Um, okay, well, thanks very much for being on with us tonight, Jake. I hope it's been uh, educational. Certainly wish you well in all your future endeavors, and uh, I hope I get to attend one of your sessions. But thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Have a good night. And uh, we'll be back next week with another show, uh, 8, 8 p.m. Fridays on Liberation Hour Radio, 102.7 FM. Facebook and YouTube and Rogers channel 946. Thanks for being with us.